Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to the third of four sets of presentations by the 2021 Emerging Voices. And we hope that you can come back for next week's presentations by Laurie Brown and Sarah Zuda. But first, a thank you on behalf of the Architectural League to the program sponsors, beginning with the principal series supporters and longtime enthusiasts for the work of young and emerging architects, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown. Additional support for the series is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the Next Generation Fund of the Architectural League, an annual fund that is supported by a group of past emerging voices and League Prize winners. Architectural League programs are also supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and by the League's members. So please consider joining the League. You can find more information about membership as well as the League's broad range of programs, projects and publications on the League's website, which is where you can learn more about this year's voices as well as past winners. The program's in its 38th season, so that's upward of 300 architects and designers. Um, the site also includes recent lecture videos and interviews. You can also read more about this year's winners and the extensive coverage provided by the Architects newspaper. As many of you know, each year the League selects eight practices based in the United States, Canada, or Mexico through an invited jury portfolio competition that recognizes talented individuals and firms with a distinct design voice and a body of accomplished work that has the potential to influence the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, and urbanism. This year's winners are notable for their energetic experimentation, engagement, and activism. We're grateful for the thoughtful expertise of the 2021 jury, Daniel Barber, Milton Curry, Mimi Huang, Rosanna Montiel, Ronald Rail, Lola Shepard, and Rosalind Shea, and for the logistical and editorial skills of League staff members Katerina Flaxman, Sarah Wessler, and Nanase Shirakawa. Competition juror Daniel Barber will introduce tonight's speakers and moderate a discussion following their presentations. He is an associate professor and chair of the PhD program in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design, as well as co-founder of Current, a web platform and publishing collective that focuses on the intersection of architectural and environmental histories. The same concerns reflected in his latest book, Modern Architecture and Climate Design Before Air Conditioning. You can be part of the conversation following the lectures by posting your questions in the Q&A section, not the chat section, please, the Q&A section, um, and CEU information will be posted during the conversation also. So with that, I'd like to welcome Daniel to introduce the speakers. Fabulous, thank you so much. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first to uh, thank as well the Architecture League and the sponsors for supporting these programs um, and for the chance to be on the jury, which was really an amazing set of discussions, a really rich opportunity. I have to say as a historian and a critic, um, which is to say not a, not a practicing architect myself, reviewing and discussing these portfolios uh, throughout this process was an amazing opportunity to really dig into the current work in the field, get a sense of how these emerging voices are negotiating the complexities of the social world relative to race and inequity, relative to climate and environment, relative to the opportunities of material and construction systems, working with clients, building relationships that can help really realize the promise of design. So again, a real honor and a pleasure to have taken part and, and also to have the chance to moderate this discussion tonight. I'm here tonight really just to do that, right, to introduce uh, two of these emerging voices, two of these firms uh, uh, that have been awarded uh, this important prize and to moderate and then open up our discussions with the audience afterwards. I'll just uh, reiterate Anne's uh, indication to please post those questions in the Q&A and I'll then bring, I'll then bring them to, to the group. And I expect uh, we'll get into this in, in, in the questions, but I, I think the, the two firms we've assembled here tonight uh, I was especially taken by how both of these uh, both of these firms are so well embedded, so deeply seated in their cities and local communities. So, uh, really looking forward to to having some discussion about that as as we proceed. We'll start with Ply Plus, uh, a practice initially founded in 1999, and then sort of merged in its current form with partners Craig Borum and Jeg McGray here with us tonight in 2016. Ply Plus has deep roots in Southeast Michigan and the Great Lakes Basin, 
exemplifying a collaborative design approach and engage not only in, in, in design, but also attentive to the extended labor and community aspects of their work. The jury was super impressed by their uh, uh, kind of deep and careful engagement with materials, uh, their, the research that led to innovations in materials, technologies, community engagement that was evident in all of their built and proposed work, elegant and thoughtful spaces that offered novel perspectives on the role of architecture, uh, not only in, in shaping and, and, re and thinking through communities, but also working with the, closely with the building industry and the opportunities that play out there. So we'll see their video in just a moment. Uh, it will be followed directly by a video from Kore and Penabad, Adib Kore and Kerry Penabad, uh, an architecture and urban design studio founded in 2001 and based in Miami. Uh, again, they uh, greatly impressed the jury with their rich engagement with place with the city of Miami initially, uh, as we'll see uh, later uh, into Guatemala and other parts of Latin America. I don't wanna preempt the video too much, but I'll just say that the jury discussions, um, you know, we were especially taken with the Escuelita Bougainvillea uh, on the Southwest coast of Guatemala that I might've pronounced wrong, sorry about that, uh, that deftly integrates design and construction strategies, uh, really calling out the rich heritage of customary practices in the region, thinking them through and reimagining them according to the, the kind of material expertise and technological design expertise that they brought. Uh, this rich engagement with place that that project exemplifies and with people is reflected in their work in the public realm of Miami from theaters to public squares carrying through this sensitive design approach amidst a wide range of contexts and clients. So again, I just want to sort of open this up and, and give you this brief sense of our guests tonight. I won't say any more, but uh, we'll look, to, uh, look forward to the videos and to our, our discussion afterwards. So uh, thank you all for being here. Founded in 1999 as PLY and reimagined under the new partnership of Craig Borum and Jen May Gray in 2016, PLY Plus is a collaborative architecture practice dedicated to design excellence with an experimental approach to design research and creative invention. We work across a wide range of project types, often helping bring an architectural expression to the visions of our institutional and community partners. The work that we will share with you today reflects our team's expertise as it is elevated by our close engagement with our clients, consultants, and the tradespeople whose knowledge expand the scope of what is possible when working collectively. We have learned that approaching projects in this manner yields quality that exceeds typical budget expectations and enables the successful implementation of complex first-time projects. We take great pride in the work that we do and are so grateful for this opportunity to invite you to join us for a short journey through Southeast Michigan to visit three of our recent projects that exemplify our broader body of work. Practicing architecture in the Great Lakes Basin of the Midwest situates our work both geographically and culturally. Geographically, we live in an immensely important watershed, home to 40 million people and the world's largest freshwater system. The natural features of this territory have profoundly shaped the urban patterns and processes that establish the context for past, present, and future architectural innovations. Culturally, the ubiquity and dynamics of industries throughout the region embody a gritty ethos of making that inspires our practice from design conception through construction. The legacies of industry are complex and often challenging, yet they also have produced a notable philanthropic character and important institutional anchors. This is a vibrant and spirited region that inspires our dedication to design excellence and the uniquely local community focused visions that contribute so much to our experience of place. MOCAD is a young institution that presents exhibitions and programming around contemporary, visual, literary, music, and performing arts, connecting Detroit to the global art world, while simultaneously serving the city as a free and open place to meet, learn, and build community. Located on Woodward Avenue in Garfield, between Detroit's downtown and its cultural district, the museum is an innovative addition to Detroit's vibrant midtown neighborhood and the Sugar Hill Arts District. It has become an important hub for the exploration of emerging ideas in the contemporary arts. 
22,000 square foot building was originally designed in 1906 by Albert Kahn as one of the first auto showrooms in Detroit. After numerous other uses, the building was renovated in 2006 by Andrew Zago Architects into the new museum while maintaining its palpably historic and gritty character. With its raw, flexible, and long span spaces, the building is well suited to the exhibition of contemporary art. Our initial task was to transform the underdeveloped parking lot of the museum and Mike Kelly's mobile homestead site into a cohesive campus. Our design opens a new connection through the block, creating a continuous pedestrian pathway and a new outdoor performance space. This presented an opportunity to reorient the museum entrance to the performance space, integrating MOCAD into its urban context. Much of our work involves upgrading and providing new infrastructure that the museum currently lacks. From a heating and cooling system that brings air conditioning and humidity control to the museum for the first time, to stormwater management strategies that provide a visual marker of environmental improvements. In each case, our goal is to leverage these improvements to enhance the art and community programming of the institution. Arts programming at MOCAD has always made use of the full extents of its building and site. Outside events include art performances, installations, as well as a summer concert series and youth events. Our design simply gives these activities more spatial presence and support. Our design reconceives the current parking lot as an event plaza that accommodates parking, while utilizing graphics that prioritize the legibility of its use for outdoor events. The renovation work includes improvements to the building as well. These include reopening a portion of the Woodward Avenue facade, expanding the existing bar and cafe to allow for full restaurant service, renovating the existing restroom to provide all gendered use, and designing a new entry canopy off the plaza. Perhaps the most important change is the relocation of the main entry from Garfield to a location that directly connects with the new plaza and pedestrian corridor. This change increases the porosity and transparency between inside and outside, and allows the energy of the arts programming to flow across the site. The new entry transforms the building's rough utilitarian backside into a prominent facade for an important cultural and urban hub. The new cantilevered canopy evolved in response to a series of complex and shifting constraints. These include the integration with existing structure and space limitations driven by utility easements. The interior renovations are strategically surgical and often strip away existing layers to enhance the raw character of the industrial space while carefully positioning refined elements that enhance the visual connections between the museum and the city. Infrastructural improvements to the environmental systems and enclosure are also carefully designed to achieve a more contemporary standard of performance. They are carefully integrated to recede into the background in order to highlight the work of artists and performers and community members alike. Strategic cuts have been made between the three main areas of the building, revealing a layering of spaces that draws the public through them, from Woodward to the new event plaza. Finally, the Woodward windshield is a return to the level of visual connectivity the building was originally designed to achieve as an auto showroom, inviting the city into the museum and reopening the glass facade that has been bricked in, closing it off for so long. The drive along Woodward Avenue from MoCAD to Marl offers some important insights into the legacy of industry in our region. Woodward Avenue is Detroit's most iconic radial road, running 27 miles from Detroit to Pontiac. First formalized after the Detroit Fire of 1805, Woodward Avenue made history when it was converted to the first mile of concrete highway in 1909. Within seven years, its entire length was paved and Woodward became the cultural center of the Motor City. Woodward is also the site of the Ford Paquette plant, where the Ford Model T was developed and Ford's first moving assembly line in Highland Park. Further north on Woodward, the Cranbrook Academy was established as a site dedicated to arts and crafts education and a counterpoint to Ford's advancements in automation. The debate between the values of life represented by city versus countryside and production versus craft have an ongoing influence to this day. Our own approach to this history is to adopt a both-and attitude and explore the opportunities that arise from the depths of tradition and making through digital fabrication and handcraft. The Michigan Animal Rescue League is one of Southeast Michigan's most established animal shelters, serving the community since 1953. The new building replaced an undersized and outdated structure that served as a shelter for almost 60 years. The transformation from old to new looked to balance some of the attributes of the previous shelter that were valued by the staff and community, including an approachable and welcoming scale and the use of moral blue. 
the new construction expanded the space given over to animal care, including the addition of a dedicated medical wing, thereby greatly enhancing Marl's ability to achieve its mission of being a community leader in nonprofit animal welfare and providing the highest quality of life to dogs and cats through rescue, medical care, short and long-term sanctuary, adoption, education, and outreach. We worked in close partnership with Marl's amazing design committee with an eye to the role that architecture can play in improving the quality of the weight for a forever home and achieving a different breed of shelter. The topography of the site drops from north to south, which allowed us to organize all of the animal care spaces on a shared level and to tuck an administrative suite of offices and conference space underneath the new southern entry. The adaptable cat swing is organized along the southern facade of the building and provides three rooms with custom cat condos and a cage-free cat room. The windows in each room are animated with activity as the cats explore the custom wood shelves and perches that provide continuous routes of movement or sunlit naps. The dog neighborhoods occupy the center of the building and are organized around an open courtyard space. Each neighborhood provides indoor and outdoor space for four dogs including a shared outdoor play space for each group of four. Inside, the neighborhoods are separated by doors to minimize the acoustic transfer of sound, thereby helping eliminate triggers that can elevate the stress levels of dogs and staff alike. Finally, the north wing of the building follows the footprint of the previous shelter by reusing the existing footings. It provides a dedicated intake entry and medical spaces for exams, surgery, recovery, and holding. The building design deploys a strong use of color to maintain Marl's community identity while signaling an exciting forward-looking future with the improved facility. From the adoption entry, visitors are greeted with a main reception desk, as well as views into the adoptable cat and dog spaces. The development of these spaces was heavily influenced by scientific research in the animal behavior and welfare literature to address key spatial and environmental challenges that can lead to unhealthy stress levels for sheltering cats and dogs, including natural light levels, noise levels, and animal housing design that accommodates freedom of movement and choice. In the adoptable cat's room, this led to the design of custom condos that provide airflow, choice of side and visual openness, and views to outside. Marl has witnessed that the quality of the weight of its animals can greatly improve their future success when adjusting to life with a new family. Likewise, the building project challenges animal shelter stereotypes by deploying the use of a central courtyard to provide the adoptable dog's neighborhoods with abundant natural light, acoustic control, and the elimination of nose-to-nose -nose kennels. The environmental control systems include a high rate of fresh air exchange and radiant floor heating for the interior and exterior portions of the dog's kennels. Marl has now been open since October of 2020 and continues to provide its full range of services to the community, including adoptions by appointment. Staff have already noted improvements in the post-op recovery rates of its animals, a decrease in stress-induced behaviors, and appreciate many of the same architectural qualities that have the capacity to elevate the well-being of all of its occupants. Fostering a spiritual community has always been at the heart of the mission of St. Mary Mercy Hospital. The first building of the current campus was established in 1959 by a group of Felician sisters to serve a community in urgent need of healthcare as the auto industry grew exponentially. Since this time, the population of the region has continued to grow and become demographically and spiritually diverse. While Catholic in its mission, the hospital recognized the growing diversity of its community. It established a design brief to serve the range of faiths represented in the community, including three main spiritual spaces, the main Catholic chapel, a non-denominational reflection space, including an enclosed courtyard, a Muslim prayer space with proper facilities for ablution rites. Each of these brought with it its own differing spatial typology, the Catholic mass with its focus on procession, individual reflection using nature as a point of focus, and individuals collectively oriented toward Mecca. The siding of the chapel was developed to integrate into the existing interior organization of the hospital, as well as to act as a visual beacon to those approaching and passing by. Using the flat massing of the existing building as a backdrop, the silhouette of the chapel dips to borrow the cross from the existing facade, and then rises to present a more prominent contrast to the hospital massing. The figuration and plan articulates each of the main rooms for worship and reflection, and then is tightly wrapped with a unifying surface allowing each room its autonomy while uniting them in a singular overall form. The chapel serves the hospital community as a 24-7 place of prayer, healing, and refuge, as well as providing a daily 6 a.m. mass. 
The chapel's apertures match orientations with programmatic opportunities, including a high east window to provide early light for the morning service. There is a southern opening that holds a custom installation of dichroic glass that bounces spectral colors into the space, recalling the history of stained glass windows, and a row of western-facing windows that establish a relationship with the future healing. The interior of the chapel is animated with a number of key elements that play a role in spatializing the relationships between liturgical and symbolic markers. The interior walls, ceiling, and door of the sanctuary, as well as the dichroic glass window, are positioned and sculpted to articulate the importance and relationship between the carved stone altar, the tabernacle, and the ambo. The entry door integrates a black and steel frame with two layers of slightly distorted walnut slats. Positioned in relationship to each other, they create a visual moiré as the door moves from open to closed. The material and geometric expression of the door signifies the importance of this threshold, while also allowing visibility into the chapel welcoming visitors. The geometry of the conical corner of the chapel celebrates the position of the tabernacle, the most important liturgical element within the sanctuary. The development of the ceiling geometry strengthens a visual connection with the tabernacle in contrast to the processional axis of the space, which aligns with the solid stone carved altar. On the exterior, this important corner is accentuated by the patterning of the brickwork and coincides with the tallest moment in the building's silhouette. The complex brick patterning at this corner was intended to accentuate the large, relatively unbroken surface of brick creating a varied texture that transforms with the dynamic play of light across the day. The pattern was designed and refined through iterative experiments with both digital and physical modeling. These experiments became the tools we used to engage the Masons in a collaborative dialogue that coupled our ability to quickly adapt to shifts in pattern and spacing with our digital tools and the feedback from their tacit knowledge. This collaboration allowed us to tailor the drawings and information models we produced to streamline their work making micro adjustments in the head joints of the mortar so that the varied length of each course as it traverses the corner resolves at the termination of the wall in an uncut brick. This approach also established regions of the wall with consistent patterns of spacing and rotation, yet visually yields a gradually shifting pattern. Here's Mike Piazza, the head mason for Davenport with one of the digital models we organized by brick course on his indestructible iPad. This model allowed him to give us live feedback course by course as they made minor field adjustments that we could then calibrate back to our models as the work progressed. From Mike's end, he brought skill and ingenuity to staging and establishing methods to facilitate consistency in the pattern across his whole team of masons. Using the masons' trusty string line, but instead of horizontal calibration, they deployed them vertically across the facade, establishing the leading points of rotated brick. This is one of several aspects of the project that are extensions of ongoing design research into environmental performance and digital fabrication workflows and give important spatial and material expression to the overall design and ultimately to the way the space and the architecture is experienced. In reflecting on these efforts and the productivity of collaboration is necessary to realize the conical corner, we have embarked on a research project through the Talbot College Prototyping Tomorrow Grant Program bringing together the power of digital tools and the craft and skill of the masons to produce a more robust workflow. We hope that by combining 3D parametric modeling, BIM, and mixed reality technology using Fologram for HoloLens with the tacit knowledge base of the masons, we can achieve the potential to enhance our workflow, linking evaluative feedback analyses across multiple software platforms to iteratively refine a range of brick bond and wythe patterns that simultaneously achieve a high level of energy performance, structural autonomy, and the necessary protection against water and vapor penetration as a building envelope. Back inside the chapel, the three primary liturgical elements, the tabernacle, the altar, and the ambo, became a project within the project. These elements complement the geometries of the building and were each carved from solid pieces of dolomitic limestone. The three elements were fabricated by Quara Stone in Madison, Wisconsin, using the digital models we produce to guide the robotic carving. With our clients and the team from Quarra Stone, we traveled to Upper Wisconsin to select the individual blocks of stone we would work from. Looking at the grain of veining and the integrity of its mass for evidence of fissures before extraction. Back in Madison, we worked with Quarra Stone using 3D prints as shop drawings prior to turning the robots loose on the stone. The chapel's ceiling geometry was developed to inscribe an experience of intimacy and scale while establishing an important focal point on the tabernacle. The tabernacle is visited throughout the day by the hospital's lay ministers to transport the Eucharist to those patients too ill to attend a Mass in person. The diagonal axis of the ceiling brings a visual importance to this function and balances the more traditional axes inscribed in the terrazzo floor. 
we constructed a scaled physical model to study this geometry, which informed our selection of ceiling products able to provide a continuously perpendicular relationship between the ceiling slats and the floor to assure that the systems above the ceiling were obscured from oblique views. Of all the custom elements, however, the dichroic window garnered a special importance to the project when it was sponsored by a group of hospital nurses in honor of a colleague who they lost that year. A previous research grant funded by Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and Guardian Glass enabled us to study an environmental application of dichroic glass and develop a specific recipe that aimed to take advantage of its capacity to reflect colors of the visible light spectrum in controllable directions. This knowledge translated to the chapel through the deployment of a laminated glass application of dichroic glass, along with the design of a custom steel framework that organizes the two dichroic films at angles and spacing that maximize the range of colors produced across the seasons. The visual effects recall the rich color qualities of stained glass windows while adding a dynamism to the movement of light across the curved walls of the sanctuary. The Emerging Voices Recognition is a tremendous honor for which we are incredibly grateful. And on behalf of our entire team, we would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to this year's jury and the Architecture League of New York, and our congratulations to the other winners. It has offered us the opportunity to reflect on the work we have achieved in the past five years, as well as look forward to the next five and to share the outcomes of the collective efforts we've embarked upon with our clients and in anticipation of collaborations yet to come. Good evening. My name is Adib Kure. And I'm Carrie Penabad. And we're very happy to be with you this evening. First and foremost, we would like to thank the jury, as well as Anne Rieselbach and Katarina Flaxman from the Architectural League. We would also like to thank our extraordinary team of collaborators. Without them, the work that we will show you tonight would not be possible. And lastly, we would like to congratulate the other winners. We're very happy to be included in your company. We have organized this evening's presentations in two parts. The first is a video shot in Miami that highlights some of the key projects that we've completed in the city and the ways in which Miami has helped to shape the work of the firm. Following, we will present two projects that we completed in Guatemala. These projects serve as a bridge between our work in Miami and our expanding work in Latin America. But more importantly, they highlight some of the key themes and core values of our work. We find inspiration everywhere, in the ancient, in the contemporary, in the commonplace and the extraordinary, in the academic and in the vernacular, and I think this perspective keeps us curious, it keeps us open-minded, and allows us to ask how our work can contribute to that wider world. Important for us in our education and in, in this way of seeing the world was being exposed to a very influential historian when we were students at the University of Miami School of Architecture, a historian by the name of Vincent Scully, who passionately spoke to us about the greats, not only the great cities, both ancient and modern cities, but also the great masters of architecture. He spoke to us about preferring the both and as opposed to the either or, preferring the black and white as opposed to the black or white. And so this all-inclusive uh, sensibility resonated with us strongly and to this day has informed the way we think about architecture. Our work began in Miami and then spread to Latin America and the Caribbean Basin. And interestingly, each project has been distinctly different than the next. And it's caused us to uh, evaluate the particulars of each place to determine how we would make the most meaningful contributions. And so we search for those traditions and we search for that kind of cultural context. And those histories shape the way in which we think about architecture in the way in which we, in we engage the city. We've worked in at least three distinctly different contexts. The new city, which is returning to the city center, densifying. Um, and so there we were committed to designing a new public space for the city, a city that lacks places where we can gather, 
um, lacks identity often. And in other projects, we were challenged to work within the more ordinary suburban landscape. In those cases, we were very much interested in trying to, trying to understand and connect to the colloquial side of Miami, the everyday side of Miami. And there, we set ourselves in sharp contrast to that landscape. And finally, we've had the opportunity to work within more historic context. And what we tried to do there was try, as much as possible, preserve the architecture of that Miami, of that period of Miami. And we did that by trying to be as careful, but also almost as invisible as possible when operating within the house. And so in that context, we were more anonymous, more silent. That's something that you don't really learn very much in schools of architecture. You're always asked to be exceptional, to be unique. But sometimes it's okay to be silent. Perhaps that's the strongest impact that you can make. Our travels have taken us to places as far as Rome and Tokyo. You see the world through a distinctly different lens. And for us, we record that world by way of drawing. This knowledge that we gain from drawing, we try to also impart upon our own students when we teach them about architecture and the relationship between the city and the physical world of, of architecture. The drawing of a place, even through the simplest of sketches, allows us to slow down and analyze what is truly distinctive about this particular site and how can that help us think through our own work. We're optimistic about the future. We believe in the power of design to improve the quality of people's lives. I think now more than ever, architecture is a collective act that is fundamentally about the building of cities. And I think that future city relies on the ability to balance the time-tested wisdom of the ages and bring that with us alongside the embracing of technology and innovation. Those two will allow us to forge forward in a way that is both rooted in this time and place, but carrying with it the lessons of the past. This map describes both the geographic and the cultural context of our work. And as you can see, Miami is at the center of the image. Miami is arguably a city in between two worlds, a city that when viewed from New York can seem like an exotic province, an outpost. And yet when seen from the Caribbean or Central America, it is a capital. It is a city that is located at either the edge or the center, depending on your frame of reference. And as such, it is a city that is continuously reinventing itself. Miami is set within the broader cultural context of the Caribbean. And this geographic circumstance has had a profound and often defining influence on the configuration and constitution of the city. For us, Miami belongs to the world of the Bahamas, to the world of Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Guatemala, and Cuba. And while there are certainly differences in both the natural and built landscapes of these places, the cloud mountain skies, the expansive seas, sponge-like geology, and flora and fauna are shared phenomena. The Caribbean, as defined by the Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez, is a place both vivid and terrible, with a dust-choked air that carries the smell of sleeping alligators. The Caribbean is also a magical world of overlapping cultures. It is where the transcendental encounter of the olive and the corn took place, and where many impulses and traditions cross each other. And this confluence produces a kind of mestizaje, a blending both in the people and in the built environment. This is the world we come from.
At the heart of our work is the pursuit of an architecture of place, material realism, and context. We agree with the historian Jordan Sand that every city has its own vernacular, a language of form, space, and sensation shaped by the local history of habitation. Nevertheless, this interest is not only a regional preoccupation, but also a universal one, and one that includes the validity of universal and timeless architectural principles, such as scale, proportion, materiality, and the relationship between the parts. And although we realize that the role of place is arguably a somewhat marginal issue in today's architectural climate, we believe it is extremely pertinent and we are convinced that it is more urgent than ever. We pursue these interests not only in our practice, but as faculty at the University of Miami School of Architecture, where we lead a series of studios titled Vernacularology. These studios focus on the study of vernacular urbanism and vernacular architecture throughout Latin America in a search for what is most essential and therefore most resilient in architectural form. This video done in collaboration with the University of Miami Institute for Data Science and Computing depicts the vernacular urban patterns of an informal neighborhood in Barranquilla, Colombia. The, there is wisdom, we believe, in these patterns as they produce compact, incremental, mixed use urban environments that respond to the particulars of climate and the particulars of, of place. In 2009, soon after the beginning of the Great Recession, we shifted our practice away from Miami and towards Latin America. Travels to the region connected us to the place and introduced us to a group of extraordinary individuals that would later become our clients. One of our first projects in Guatemala was the design of a corporate headquarters for a local sugar mill. This video depicts the model that we built as a type of carry-on, so to speak, for our many travels to the capital, to Guatemala City. And as you can see, the form of the building is set within a patchwork of gardens that is meant to extend the workings of the building towards the exterior. I guess you could say that this is our idea of a high-tech animation. In traveling to Guatemala, we immerse ourselves in the rich cultural and architectural traditions of the place. We found beauty in the forms of the boyo and the way in which these modest buildings seem to mimic the majestic volcanoes in the distance. We were also struck by the formidable Mayan traditions, the siting of their buildings, and the manipulation of the surfaces of their stone facades. By observing and drawing these buildings, we began to understand that due to the position of the sun in this region, very subtle projections on the surface were capable of producing deep and dramatic shadows. The project for the MAG headquarters is located on the flat coastal landscape of Guatemala's lowland along the Pacific coast. The building is set within a defined precinct surrounded by gardens, and it is precisely oriented to the cardinal points with the primary elevations facing north and south. This manner of orienting buildings dates back to the pre-Columbian civic building traditions. The precinct, as you can see in this image, is surrounded by the sugarcane fields and the company's current offices to the south. While this early sketch depicts our preoccupation with the siting of the building. And like most buildings built in the US today, this building is not hermetically sealed. Instead, it is meant to open to the exterior and passively cross ventilate for certain periods of the day. As such, its overall form is thin, it's elevated from the ground and sculpted in order to allow for hot air to rise up and out of the building. Here we can see the plans of the building organized as a repetitive module for both economy as well as ease of construction with the large open working space at the center of the plan. The section highlights the sculpting of the building's interior and the clear hierarchy of the central hall, hall illuminated from above. Drawing plays an important role in our office, in our work. This image entitled El Dia de la Safra depicts the building in context and reveals 
our desire to create a building with a clearly discernible figure in a scale that could register against the vast tropical landscape. Our references here came from both the industrial generic sheds of the area, as well as the venerable Mayan pyramidal structure seen earlier. This second drawing entitled Memoria del Volcán emphasizes the square openings that frame the view towards that expansive la landscape. The drawing is a large drawing. It is three feet by nine feet in length and it explores a mix of digital and hand techniques. We believe that this work exemplifies our commitment to drawing as both representation, narrative, and sometimes provocation throughout all phases of the design process. Here we see the building soon after its completion set against the sugarcane fields in the foreground and a view of the main entry that frames the majestic Volcán del Fuego in the distance. This entry sequence was meant to bring that distant landscape into the frame, almost like a painting. At the entrance is a molino or the company's first mill. We happen to find it lying along the side of a concrete walkway at the current mill and we wanted to recover it placing it at the entry to remind both the employees and the visitors of the company's beginnings. This night view of the service entry reveals the surface manipulation that was inspired by our earlier studies of the low-lying Mayan reliefs seen on many of those stone buildings that we referenced earlier. While the end of the building seen here projects to frame yet another view of the volcanoes in the distance. The interior is expansive and filled with natural light. It is a place that gathers all the departments of the company under one roof to promote synergies and greater collaboration. And we're happy to say that this is a space that has remained active throughout the pandemic, in part because of the building's ability to cross ventilate and extend the workings of the interiors out towards the gardens. This project also allowed us to pursue all scales of design, from the overall design of the precinct to the lamps that were to be set on top of the desks. This attention to detail extended itself to the material choices of some of the key elements of the project. This final image of the building's cafeteria highlights once again the building as a framing device for the landscape and the opportunities to explore a more seamless connection between interior and exterior. It took us several years to design and build the MAG headquarters. During that time, we traveled to Guatemala each month, driving from the capital for about three hours or so until we reached the southern coast of the country. Along the way, we encountered many rural villages and came across an existing rural school that was in disrepair. We quickly learned that rural Guatemala lacks the necessary schools to educate the population. And as architects and educators, we believe that one of the key elements to combat poverty is to provide more access to education. So we partnered with the Fundación Educativa Bugambilia to design a new prototype for this rural school. The site plan depicts the current school buildings to the northeast with our proposed buildings set to the west and to the south. The master plan for the school was designed to preserve a large stand of mature landscape that was located roughly at the center of the site. To address the needs of the school, we developed a kit of parts that could be assembled in a variety of ways depending on the school's needs. The image here shows a progression from the plinth to a one-room schoolhouse to a more, a more expanded series of classroom buildings. This drawing depicts the final version of the school's new prototype, a building that contained five new classrooms with a bank of bathrooms. This drawing reveals our preoccupation with ensuring that the building would protect itself from the monsoon rains and capitalize on the prevailing breezes of the region. This is critical as the building does not rely on mechanical systems, perhaps with the exception of basic electricity. Um, it really is passively cooled. Therefore, the form 
and not the systems needed to provide the solution. Interestingly, it was during our travels to Japan that we truly came to understand that roofs began at ridges and ended on the ground through the artful manipulation and the collection of water. As such, this simple gable extends itself way beyond the building walls and a large drain at the ground collects the water from the roof above. Here we see the completed school with the children exiting the classes. The building of this structure has allowed the school to dramatically increase its student body, offering classes both by day and by night. It also reveals the material construction of the building with its concrete plinth and steel frame structure above. The structural assembly was readily produced in a nearby factory and reveals our understanding that the vernacular is a generative grammar rather than a fixed tradition and it is capable of incorporating contemporary building materials and the products of mass culture. Here we see a close-up of the building with the children on the elevated plinth. And this image, which is perhaps one of our favorites of the project, depicts a young boy that is still not old enough to attend classes, but he sits happily under the shade of the deep overhang, listening to the classes taking place behind him. This final image of the project is perhaps the most emblematic. It reveals the end of the building with its large projecting roof. This formal response was not guided solely by economy, although that indeed was a factor, but more importantly by a process of distillation that seeks to reduce the work to its most fundamental aspects. Quite the opposite of simplification, distillation is the search for quintessence. As in the process of making wine, distillation extracts the essential characteristics, resulting in an outcome that could not be further reduced without being compromised. For us, this distilled form emerges from an understanding of architectural tradition interpreted in its broadest and most holistic sense. Great, great, nice to have you, have all four of you back, back with us. Those are amazing videos. I'll, I'll just briefly take this opportunity to congratulate both firms for not only for being uh, recognized by the Emerging Voices jury, uh, but also just for the amazing work that you've just presented to us. It's, it's really an impressive uh, body of, of built and, and imagined work and we're really happy to have the chance to talk it through a bit tonight. So thank you for those videos. Um, I'm gonna uh, start with just a few questions. And again, uh, for those in the audience, please jump in in the Q&A. We really want to hear from you. Um, but I guess I, you know, I, I, I was struck initially by uh, the importance of research to both of your practices and in, in I think complementary, but at the same time, very different ways, right? And so I wanted to hear a little more, if you could, uh, about the sort of role of research and the kind of challenges and opportunities it presents. I'm thinking in particular uh, in the uh, relative to the Ply Plus work that we were just looking through, um, uh, the ways in which the material research also seemed to have a strong role in kind of thinking through the different programs, uh, distinct programs, right? I mean, both in the, in the St. Mary Mercy project and also in the dog neighborhoods, right? I mean, the sort of importance of materials, research materials there. I mean, the, in, in the amazing way, those, you know, the result of that research led to uh, both those programmatic uh, clarifications and also the capacity to let the finished building really have its distinct character. And then in the case of, of Kure and Penabad, uh, again, really struck by uh, the intensive research into place, right? And the, and the richness with which you understood the, the environment and the histories of the buildings and their cities and their contexts, the needs of the, of the social aspects that ran through them. I'm, I'm taken by this term of yours, uh, which I'll probably mangle vernacularology, right? I did that okay. It's a bit of a tricky one, right? But, um, and so the importance of understanding those architectural and urban histories and, uh, again, the opportunities and challenges of research in that context. And so opening up that, that sort of box and, and also curious how that research aspect brings you into the educational environment in specific ways in the universities that you're in effect collaborating with on those terms. Something of a question in there, I hope. Uh, feel free to, <laughs> to jump in. Well, we, I think we both firms and all four of us share in common the fact that we are 
working between um, teaching and practice, and certainly that influences um, the things that we do every day. Uh, the research has become a more um, intentional focus for our practice, I would say, in the last five years or so. Um, and you saw a little bit of that. We we're trying to begin to hint at what we think is possible in the video, um, both because some smaller grants, which are very focused, allow us to think about ideas that then um, find homes and projects as we as we collaborate with clients, as, it, as in the case of the chapel with the dichroic glass. Um, but then there's other cases like with Marl, where the research is much more um, specifically focused on asking a question about how, how architecture can play a role in improving, in that case, environmental factors that influence um, the way that animals experience the space as well as humans. And um, not surprisingly, these things are quite similar in some ways. There's a lot of overlap between the kinds of things that we value when we're designing space um, from an experiential perception from people, um, as was the case with the animals. There were some cases where it was a little bit more uh, nuanced when we got into the animal behavior literature, but, um, but that kind of discovery of learning a project really, um, really from the point of view of its occupants, whoever they may be, um, I think shapes a lot of the work that we do. And it's part of the reason why it's, uh, it's so much fun to do the work that we do because each project is unique and we clearly share this as well from seeing the video. Um, and it's a process of discovery the whole way through. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, I, would, I would probably just reiterate that. I mean, for Adib and I, we have led really a dual life from the very beginning as we're, we both have full-time appointments at the University of Miami School of Architecture and have, taught at, and have taught at other schools of architecture as well. And I believe that that's a model that, um, that you find obviously in the pursuit of an architectural career. It's certainly one that we learned through a series of mentors that were also teacher practitioners. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it's proven to be a, a very rich and rewarding model uh, I mean, to, to answer your question perhaps more directly, um, we teach a series of studios, the design studios, as well as visualization or drawing courses at the school. Um, and in a way, some of the investigations that go on in our practice begin to influence some of the coursework, but also the coursework starts to influence the practice. So in the development of the vernacularology studios, which is basically a play on the science or the study of the vernacular, um, because of our geographic circumstance, we are, were in close proximity to obviously Latin America, but that work began um, quite far away. It actually began in India through a series of itinerant <laughs> studios that we do with the University of Miami um, entitled the Open City Studio. And this is a, when we arrived in India, we had uh, one project in mind, in fact, from a distance. And then we realized that upon arrival, it really didn't make a lot of sense. And that was the first time we started mapping the idea of the informal settlement. And then that led us to Africa, and then it brought us back to Latin America. And what we learned in that cultural mapping is that there are rich vernacular traditions that are varied in the various urban contexts in which these settlements takes place. And while vernacular architecture per se seems to be disappearing, what we consider to be vernacular urbanism is growing exponentially. And so with uh, the work that we did there, we oftentimes landed on the ground and we actually, our studio briefs no longer um, stated what it was that we were going to develop. We actually said, we're going to arrive and then we're going to engage the community and see what they have to teach us. And I actually, I have to say that, that I always thought that everybody would want a better house. I was convinced. And in fact, the initial brief that we described for that first studio was to, in essence, build a new house. But when we arrived, we realized that much of the community can build the houses incrementally, and they were in desperate need of infrastructure in the design of the public realm. So much of our studio work focused on the development of architectural projects that would integrate into those cities. And I have to say, in a way, directly influenced the work uh, of the Escuelita, which was essentially a public building for an informal center. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, fabulous. Good. I, I, it's, yeah, let's keep going, please. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would I would build on Jen's comment. I think that, and and also um, Maurice, that the 
like where we are influences enormously the, the way we've approached research, um, both in terms of material and invention. And, um, and the, the traditions of Taubman College, I think is a, um, you know, as I was, as I arrived at the college, it was a um, kind of transitioning out of a very tech heavy program into a more theory driven program. And the, the kind of ethos of making and the way that um, the shops and the equipment and the tools that were becoming exposed or we were coming available to us were really exciting. And we began to think about projects, I think, at those beginning years as um, excuses to begin to explore the possibilities of tools. And I think what's happened, particularly in the last five years or even a little bit more, is really a kind of shift in thinking about. Um, those tools as an excuse to bring value to the projects. Uh, and it's really kind of shifted the kind of position. So I think, I think you're pointing out about Marl is like a perfect example of that, the, the rescue, the Animal Rescue League. And that I think what we brought in terms of research to that was less about technology and about, um, uh, about a, a kind of way of making than it was about the relationship of materials and the quality of um, mm -hmm. the life for the animals. Um, yeah. yeah, and organize, organizing the programmatic spaces, which is where the question began. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great. Good. Well, that, I mean, this is this is fascinating, and I'm, I'm so happy to to hear from from you on those those questions. I I I guess I'm also really curious. I mean, here you know you are as emerging voices, and and I kind of want to spend some time together thinking about what are the emerging challenges that the field is facing, um, I which I think both of your presentations really uh, richly built out. Um, I'm getting a little noise. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so I'm thinking of a number of things here, you know, relative to questions of equity and, and racial justice, relative to energy efficiencies and uh, questions of climate, of course, uh, more recently, uh, you know, not as recent, well, it doesn't seem that recent anymore, but the kind of emergent challenges of the airborne virus, right? I mean, how all of these factors are, are helping us rethink, uh, re rethink the field and, you know, keep us open to, to all these issues. But I, I want to start with a, a bit more focus just for a second. I'm thinking I've been reflecting quite a bit upon the, um, let's say, the historical weight of the recent uh, Pritzker Prize award to Lakaton and Vassal and, and you know, the importance of working with existing building stock, which of course uh, both of your firms are, are playing out in very dynamic and compelling ways. And you know, the jury referred to, uh, the, the jury for the Pritzker Prize, I should say, uh, referred to uh, Lakaton and Vassal having uh, adjusted the definition of the profession of architecture, right? Which uh, seems both kind of grandiose and kind of changing uh, how we build and how we think about the built environment, but also, you know, the adjustment is, is, you know, whether it's minor or major, I think is left for us to determine collectively. So I, maybe we'd start with this kind of specific challenge and opportunity around these questions of adaptive reuse or around these questions of engaging with existing building stock and how you see those again as challenges and opportunities for practice. Uh, but again, you know, we can open out to the kind of sea level rise and the dust choked air of the Caribbean, right? And the you know, other sorts of, of, of challenges and, and ideas around, and again, environment and equity and the virus that you've also uh, collectively put on the table. I guess uh, in, the, in our case, uh, this interest in the, in the engaging uh, the historic buildings of historic importance really started at the School of Architecture, actually. We were engaged in that since we were students here in Miami, and uh, when we had the opportunity to to engage it in practice, one of the first opportunities was working actually in Barranquilla, in Barranquilla, Colombia, which is the northernmost uh, uh, coast of Colombia, and and engage we engaged uh, the historic was called the Historic City Center, and the first thing we did there was uh, try to document, understand it by way of drawing it, and so we dedicated a great deal of time to the documentation of the historic uh, city, the fabric of the historic city, those buildings that are, that are kind of in ruins, right? And trying to learn as much as possible from them and then develop a series of proposals. And somehow that research uh, led to also the, the kind of uh, the engagement of both the formal and the informal, because a lot of those buildings are actually informally inhabited within. So 
there's a very interesting kind of duality that took place when, in, in the study of a particular subject, at least uh, the historic city in, in, uh, in, in, in South America, in Latin America. In Miami, we had the opportunity to work within the very few historic buildings that remain in the city, particularly uh, the house that we showed in the video earlier. And there the, the, the idea in our case was, as Carrie explained it, was to, to be as restrained and as quiet as possible, almost as invisible as possible, and to try to, to restore it actually to, its, uh, to the way it was originally. Uh, and in, in that case, we also engaged the, the project by drawing it fully and uh, also trying to to research, uh, you know, original drawings, existing drawings of the original architect, and in order to be able to, to, to very carefully, uh, let's say, stitch back the, the house. Uh, so we've had the opportunity to work at the scale of the city uh, from a historic standpoint, but also at the scale of the individual, in this case, a very small house uh, within, within Miami. Yeah, for us, I think, uh, I mean, a great example, I think, is is the way we're approaching the work at MoCAD in relationship to Detroit. I think I think one thing when you zoom out and look at Detroit, there's a, um, if you've been to Detroit or, or kind of know Detroit, there's an, an enormous amount of, um, of vacancy, of empty space, of buildings that, um, or, or parcels that were developed and are no longer occupied. And the, what, what that, I think does in terms of a, an attitude of working in the city is really looking at what's there and trying to find value in those existing structures. And so many of them, um, you know, have been disused, have been um, years and years of, of deferred maintenance. So much of what we're doing at MoCAD um, is actually extending the, the work that Andrew Zago's uh, office did in terms of turning that into the museum. And really, I think very cleverly and carefully stitching together um, uh, a kind of relationship between what was existing and what's new. And what we're now doing, I think, in terms of the approach there is, is two strategies. One, what can we peel away rather than worry about adding? Like we don't wanna, we don't wanna, um, we don't wanna gloss over the, the existing condition. We wanna reveal the roughness of that um, context. But at the same time, we also wanna bring a little bit of refinement and, and infrastructure frankly, to the project. The, the building right now has no air conditioning. So just figuring out um, for a museum with no air conditioning, they're limited in terms of what kind of exhibits they can stage and how they do that. And how we do that and do, do it sensitively in the context of that existing building, um, both in terms of long-term relationships to energy use and consumption, uh, as well as the visual impact of in inserting new systems into a building that didn't have them. Um, it's really about trying to find the, the kind of levers to um, amplify those new infrastructural layers into more programmatic opportunities for the museum. Yeah, and this is an example where um, I think there is an overlap between the history of Detroit, the challenges of the infrastructure, um, and fast forwarding to um, the broader issues of climate because it's a project where dealing with the stormwater and, and upgrading the energy performance of the building um, pays back literally in terms of then using the money that would otherwise be spent for inefficiencies directly um, benefiting arts programming. So there's, there's this wonderful synergy between understanding that investing in those kinds of improvements um, has dual impacts. It has this kind of broader impact in participating um, and everyone being concerned about the built environment and bringing it up in terms of its performance, but it also directly impacts the operations of the museum. Yeah, great. Carrie, did you know? I, I, it's hard, sometimes hard to read if someone's about to jump in or not. I don't want to interrupt anybody, but uh, happy no, to, to I keep. I would, I would just add one thing. I guess, you know, your context is always your perspective. And for us, you know, I mean, I keep being Colombia, I'm Colombian, me being of Cuban descent, we come from cities with incredibly long and rich histories, you know, Havana, for example, who was able to, that was able to build itself, you know, for 500 years nearly steadily across time. And the kind of layering of those buildings add a richness to the place, which perhaps is in sharp contrast a bit to Miami, which is a very young city that oftentimes, um, I think it's changed in recent years, but for a long time was about really building the new 
um, which of course is important. One needs to add new chapters to the building of cities. But I think um, the careful preservation uh, and adaptive reuse of the existing stock, I think is no longer uh, first and foremost a kind of stylistic question, quite frankly, but really is a fundamental question of sustainability, of um, you know, kind of environmental demands. But um, more importantly, I think about quality of life. It's more interesting to be living in cities that have a longer trajectory mm -hmm. that can tell a greater story. So right. um, I think that's important. Yeah, fabulous. And, and I mean, it's interesting as we're talking and you know, I'm trying to keep some of my own interests a little to the edge, but thinking about how much you're, you're really operating in such dramatically different climatic environments, right? I mean, yeah. it's a really complex set of strategies and I assume challenges, right? That you're facing according to these um, you know, carbon imperatives that we're all struggling with in, in different ways. Um, uh, and, uh, questions come up in the chat, but I, I do just wanna offer one more before we turn out to the audience and please, uh, audience out there that we can't see, um, uh, keep adding those questions. We're, we'll, we'll have some time for them. But I just wanted to give both firms an, an opportunity to say a little bit about maybe some opportunities that you see coming up, some kind of next projects that you're especially excited about, uh, and or you know, kind of challenges that you see emerging in the field uh, relative to, to some of the issues that we've been discussing. Um, you know, just to kind of a, a moment to, to reflect on those future challenges and opportunities, um, please. So we're always looking for more opportunities, but the one that we're <laughs> most excited about recently is a collaboration um, uh, for a multifamily um, housing project that potentially has a future in Ann Arbor. Um, it's a little bit complicated in terms of the site and negotiations with the city, but it's essentially um, a proposal to shift the way that we're thinking about development in the city of Ann Arbor um, on a site that um, had previously had a kind of single family suburban pattern um, development proposed um, and was denied um, and now revisiting the site to preserve one of the older um, historic groves of trees in the city by densifying um, the housing into a five story um, project and, and dealing with uh, issues of, of energy more directly. So net zero in terms of the performance of the housing, but really um, extending the dynamics of the quality of life into a, a more dense model um, that changes the way that we think about um, the landscape and, and the way we think about zoning patterns and development in the city. Um, so we're hoping that there's, um, there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about the project, mm. um, but it's been a fun, fun project to be a part of that we would love to, to do more of. Um, and of course, we're, we're deep, deep in the trenches at MOCAD right now. It was on hold for a little while because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's been a fun one to return to and really try to um, um, try to work through all of the details. I, it, it also um, has had a tremendous amount of, um, of, of insight through the, both the, the staff that are there as well as the community. I mean, this is, this is one of the things that's maybe touching back on the previous question but the community really does value and has very strong opinions about the way they see the future of their own cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one of the important um, opportunities is just the continued conversation that's really strengthening across all of the projects. Um, and in spite of the pandemic and in spite of all of the separation from Zoom, um, those conversations are really intensifying as we see across um, national politics and national conversations as well. Um, and I think that I, I think that's one of the most exciting things is both in our office, the conversations that we're having, but then how those um, are shaped by um, the clients, the community, everybody that we're in conversation with um, is is really one of the most valuable things um, of all of the work that we do. So even though it doesn't necessarily have specific projects tied to it, um, I think it's 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 more, um, Kind of indication of the trajectory of the maybe the change in the way that practice is evolving and um, the kind of dynamics that um, hopefully will shape um, not just our future projects but the, the landscape of urbanism more generally. Right. Fabulous, fabulous, yeah, thank you. Please. I think uh, I, I loved your question or we loved your question because it's about you know thinking about the future um, and during the pandemic, you know, we had a, a, a chance to obviously do a lot of reading and thinking. Um, and we actually read a book uh, entitled The Future of the Professions 
by Daniel Susskind and his father, who are lawyers, and they're looking at you know, the future of the professions broadly, and within it, they included a chapter on architecture. And the opening chapter, he, he um, revealed that, uh, according to his research, that um, less than 5% of the buildings that are built in the U US are actually designed by architects, right? And so, you know, part of that can make you somewhat depressed, right? But then on the other hand, you say, well, then that means that in this new age, you know, uh, there's 95% more opportunities if you think more innovatively to not just perhaps embrace, you know, what technology has to offer us in terms of access, but to really think how architects can serve broader communities, right? Um, particularly a firm maybe like ours that could be regarded as more of a design firm, if you will, um, that might have access to certain types of clients. We've really thought hard about this and we're um, excited about a series of projects. Um, right now we're working predominantly would say, on housing at a variety of scales. Um, and so in Latin America, we're you know, developing new models for um, I would say lower to middle class income uh, because there's a rising middle class in Guatemala and the housing stock is actually um, not exemplary. And so we're looking for ways that we can um, help to contribute to better housing uh, within that Latin American context. And then just recently, we've started a collaboration with some fabulous um, developers here in Miami, young um, two female developers, which is actually uh, sort of not, it's pretty unique actually, young, uh, and they're very invested in the city and they're looking to build affordable housing uh, models for, um, for the city on smaller parcels, which is highly unusual in Miami. Mm -hmm. I think something that the city really needs to confront um, because we have uh, an enormous challenge with affordable housing in our city. It only really operates at the two extremes. And so right, the opportunity right. to add more value within, um, within, within the realm of housing is where uh, our focus has been as of late. Although we would love to do a project like Jen and Craig for an institution. Like <laughs> <laughs> we're, you know, we're open to, to all. <laughs> So, fabulous, great. And, you know, as I was asking that question, Paul Lewis was posting a, a question in the Q and A that that you've kind of answered one part of, but I want to I want to ask you to kind of address the other part. Um, Paul says, uh, in effect, that uh, you know, thanking you both for your fantastic work, and also noting that in many respects, it's it's more mature than our, our emerging voices uh, name might suggest. Um, so, so he's asking uh, what interests from your earlier careers have faded as you've, you know, matured in your practices and in, in your uh, relationships. And then he also asks about sort of what's coming next, which I think we've maybe kind of covered, but feel free to continue there. But, uh, you know, what, what have you maybe sort of seen yourselves moving past uh, uh, based on your, your earlier work? And yeah, and again, if you want to draw that through to some challenges, uh, present and future, please. Sure. I think I think for us, uh, and I, I touched on this before, and and the kind of origins of Ply was very much involved with digital fabrication, and and kind of bringing that into a way of making, and and much of the work we did at that time was um, was really built by us. Like we were mm. literally putting the screws in the in the plywood, <laughs> um, and I think what we learned kind of as as we progressed in our practice was that we had to figure out a way to communicate some of that better to others to implement. That the efficiencies of, of working at that scale and working with that kind of intensity um, limited what we could do kind of broadly. And it also limited the scale that we could work. And I think, I think when we began to, to kind of work more toward the, the workflow and the communicative aspect of the kinds of work that we're producing to allow others with actually more expertise and more skill to begin to implement that work. Uh, it really transformed, I think, the, both the scope, the scale, and the possibilities of how we were working. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that early work laid the kind of groundworks to a way of thinking about making, uh, thinking about materials and the manipulation of materials in our work that we've been able to extend and kind of develop, I think, um, really strong ways of communicating with the, the skilled trades that are, that are working on a project. So we try to be on site quite a bit. It's, it's just changed the dynamic of, of how we've worked, uh, I think, uh, um, in, in a large part. Yeah. 
Um, how we see that going forward, I think, is a is a continuation of that scale, that scalar shift of getting um, developing a kind of relationship of expertise uh, in terms of how we make, uh, but also in terms of um, I think we've shifted from approaching those projects with like a, a pretty strong conviction about this is how it's going to be done to walking onto a job site or beginning to work with a contractor um, and approaching it more as an amateur um, mm -hmm. and engaging them in a way of, of, com uh, of conversation and of dialogue that really elevates their status in terms of their knowledge and, and skill um, and then filters that and feeds that back through our own process. Um, and we bring our skills to kind of make them better and they bring their knowledge, I think, that, that improves how we work. So hopefully that will continue to scale up um, uh, and not lose the, the kind of sense of, of kind of hands-on and kind of connection that we have with the work. Amazing. Please. I guess, well, thank you so much for, for the question. Um, I, you know, in reflecting on that, I mean, it's always hard to be like self-reflective about one's own trajectory, I guess. Um, but, for, and it's also nice to know you can emerge when you're not in your 20s. Um, but uh, but I, I think that it's, it's been, I think our, the pursuit of, uh, of an architecture of place, as we said in the presentation, has really been at the heart of our, of our investigations. And, and I think it's been able to be enriched and deepened by moving outside of, of let's say, Miami. I think the work in Latin America allowed us to, I even think, bring, gain greater confidence in some of the things that we really believe in, because we were able to break away from some of the normative conditions that we take for granted in the US. Again, just as simple as the idea of uh, buildings always needing to be hermetically sealed, you know, the kind of relentless, you know, pursuit of the air conditioned space in Miami, this is, you know, a daily occurrence. And so working in Latin America where some of these norms are, are not the same, allowed us to really um, have to rely on the building's forms uh, rather than the building systems, first and foremost. Not to say that we didn't embrace it. I mean, the, the building for the, the sugar mill, for instance, we collaborated with Arab, and that was an extraordinary experience. And they came on quite late in the process. And we were so happy to say that much of what they did was, you know, sort of add sophistication to what was already a kind of fundamental formal decision um, that had needed to respond to that place. Um, and, and I think what it also did is that by, by again, rethinking what we consider to be the norms, um, and let's say just something as simple as opening up the buildings, we had to design buildings whose interiors are actually exteriors. Um, and I think that is also been a kind of eye-opening experience for us because, you know, the minute that you rethink the way we use our buildings and open them up, you have to actually rethink the entire assemblies of the interiors because something as simple as you know drywall can't can't actually resist you know the a capacity to open up. So then we've been thinking, how can we take some of those lessons you know from our Latin American experiences and then bring them into an American context? Um, and again, always with the idea of, of the question of uh, of the architecture of place. Good. I'm going to turn to our, um, our Q&A. Um, this is such an interesting discussion. I want to keep going, but I want to give some of the, some of the <laughs> audience a chance to chime in. Um, I want to start with a, a question from Edward Wolking, uh, asking, in effect, given the, the design, the uniqueness of each of the design challenges that you face and the emphasis on research that we've been talking about, um, uh, the question is how many projects can you can your firms reasonably sustain at the same time and you know maybe a little bit about that sort of juggling act and, and how you manage it. Yeah. We Great. it's not just us we're a group of nine which I hope sure. you remember our little <laughs> our little group of, of faces yeah. and um, I mean the thing that's amazing is with nine people you you can sustain an awful lot because we have an incredibly talented and committed group of people that we're working with. Um, and the research I think is part of the reason, um, part, of, part of what brings us all together is probably the easiest way to say it. Um, so there's a balance. I mean, we're not showing all of the work that we do. We have some incredibly 
unglorious work that we do as well um, that, that builds space for some of the more exploratory work. Um, and so perhaps the hardest thing to balance is, is finding, navigating those things and finding the lessons that you can learn from um, the work that we're probably not going to share in more of a portfolio format, but that sure. you're learning workflows, you're learning communication, other kinds of things that then circles back to the more research oriented work. Um, so it depends on the project, but, um, but we, we have had moments where we've had a couple of the larger projects overlapping. Um, and with our small crew um, are really uh, advancing the work in pretty exciting ways. And that may change depending on how, um, how it evolves and what other opportunities um, we are able to pursue. Um, but we are pretty intentionally trying to balance the kinds of projects that we're doing so that we're um, doing enough of the work that can kind of open up space that, that we're, we're moving back and forth between those two realms of, of work. Yeah, I would say I agree with uh, with a uh, with a comment. In our case, is very similar. It's always a challenge for us, uh, particularly in our case, having to move from Miami and travel to Latin America, mm -hmm. both Guatemala and and Colombia. Actually, in our, uh, recently, uh, and, you know, thankfully, it's only a two-hour flight. Let's say from uh, from Miami to 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 these places in Latin America. It's actually easier to get to. To uh, Guatemala, there is sometimes, oftentimes, you get to Boston instead of New York. <laughs> uh, but it's always a challenge, and we also have, you know, we thankfully we work with an incredibly, as uh, a great team. And it's a small team, but it's a great team, ten of us. Uh, and we have to challenge all these different projects at different scales and in different geographies. Um, but the, for us, it's always it's been important to keep it somehow to those scales in terms of the team. Uh, because I think Carrie and I both like to participate uh, in all aspects of the work from the beginning uh, all the way to the end, right? The initial meetings and discussions with the team and the clients all the way through uh, engaging of the project of this being uh, finalized and so on. So, uh, but it is a challenge and I think it's probably going to continue to be particularly in these days, these months coming up. You know, maybe one model that we found that has also worked for us is that when we've been uh, presented with the opportunity to do a kind of larger scale work, then we've also partnered or collaborated. We've brought, we brought partners in for projects, uh, which allows us to expand as necessary and then you know, contract depending upon the different scales of the work. So that has been a more flexible model for us in the practice as well. Okay. I, I, um, okay. <laughs> you're welcome to jump yeah. in, please. No, I would say very similar for us. I mean, we've, okay. we've at times partnered up with other other firms that have um, deeper resources and more, sure. Um, sure. let's say, ability, and particularly in the kind of moments of, of kind of production and management than we've been able right. to. But okay. but more importantly, I think what's happened over that trajectory of the office is that as the work is scaled up, it's allowed. A different kind of stability in our team. Yeah, um, where mm -hmm. I think in the early years, you know, there was an incredible cycle of doing a project and moving on to, um, you know, larger, larger firms doing bigger work. Um, and so the, the staff and the crew was very quick, you know, incredibly skilled and, and great people have come through the office. But I think in the past, um, you know, six or seven years, we've had a, a really ability to kind of bring a generation of, of, of next team members up that are beginning to run their own projects and beginning to, to handle work that has expanded what, we, what we've been capable of doing. Great. Um, so we're nearing the end of our session. I'm, I'm wondering if we, we have one more question I might wanna pose and should we go ahead and, okay. Um, so I, I do wanna, uh, we have two more questions in the chat. One, I, Feel like we've kind of covered in terms of thinking about uh, your, your earlier part of your career. So I want to focus on another that opens up a huge box of issues that of course we won't be able to cover in the next kind of two and a half minutes, but or even if we extend to seven and a half. But the question around is around gentrification and, and how gentrification has impacted your work. Of course, both of them, both of your sort of home bases in, in cities where these are significant issues. And so I'll just leave it uh, at that to, to get some responses and again, somewhat sensitive to our relatively short time frame, if possible. How has gentrification affected your work? Sorry, it's from Gabby Levy, it was the 
the question came from. It's an important question. I, I, um, maybe the short answer is just to use a project that we haven't spoken about as, as an example, which is a, um, a teaching school also in Detroit um, on a previous college campus, the Mary Grove Teaching School, which is a really direct and interesting response to the effects of gentrification in Detroit on public education. Um, which is that it's led to choice in public education, um, which means that there's been a kind of competition for students migrating to schools and, um, and other schools get left behind in that competition. So this is a, a collaboration between the Marygrove campus, between um, U of M School of Education and the Detroit um, public school system um, to think of a campus as um, as a resource for the community. And so they're reinvesting in historic buildings, bringing back um, what they call cradle to career. So pre-education um, pre all the way through career training as a way of establishing continuity in a community that um, has directly suffered from other parts of the city going through gentrification and, and leaving um, parts of this community behind. So that's been a really exciting project to, to think about how architecture can kind of extend these larger urban and community goals through the models of education um, in, in that particular location in Detroit. And for Detroit, it's really, I think, the, the idea of gentrification is a relatively new thing. Uh, I mean, and 15 years ago, um, Detroit was in dire straits. Um, and the rebirth or the kind of um, renaissance that's happening is primarily in the downtown area and primarily a kind of business oriented model between Bedrock and, and others that have um, really, I, I think, both elevated the kind of property values and price range, but Detroit is enormous. It's 135 square miles um, and they're focused on 7.2. And so the relationship of what happens beyond that has been critical. And it's a kind of two edged sword, like the influx of that money has also increased a, a, a number of resources in relationship to philanthropy for institutions that have been around for a long time. Um, and that, for instance, Marl is an entirely um, um, philanthropic project. The chapel as well was uh, entirely funded by, by donors. Mar, uh, MOCAD is almost entirely funded through, through um, philanthropy. And so the, that while the, the resources of gentrification are kind of doing their work downtown, that um, the benefits are beginning to reap more broadly and having effects in the communities that are not necessarily um, uh, benefiting directly, let's say, from, from those areas where the, the intensity is happening. Great. Again, it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging question, <laughs> the question of gentrification. Um, and what is the role of the architect uh, in that? Uh, I, think, I think we could, as Daniel saying, probably spend quite some time talking about that as it relates to our own work. I said some of our early work in Miami in particular was in the public realm in neighborhoods that had been long forgotten in which um, let's say private development came in and did significant investments and our work participated in the kind of build out of the public realm. And across time, of course, you see the impact of when a neighborhood has been forgotten and then gets investment and then what happens. And inevitably there is this cycle of gentrification, right? So in that case, the project didn't directly deal with that, but over time you see how it has had impact. So I think what we thought about lately is perhaps it's about being able to add more value to more people. And so this is why we're excited about some of the work in the affordable housing, particularly at the smaller scales, because if more sectors of the city could offer more robust choices, basically, so that you have more opportunities and not always the need to displace, then perhaps you know, we can build more equitable cities. But I think it's a, it's a challenge. It, it, it's yeah. truly a challenge. I think, I think this is probably a place that we're going to stop with a kind of open-ended conversation that also makes us want to come back, check back in with each of you in two or three years to see the housing that you've each produced and do a kind of compare and contrast in terms of climate and scale and configuration. Um, please join us next week for the 
last of this year's programs, although um, the league staff has been interviewing all of the emerging voices, this year's emerging voices. So there'll be a series of interviews published on the league's website coming out in April and early May that will carry these conversations on a bit further besides. So thanks to all of you and to our moderator. It's been a super interesting evening and we're looking forward to seeing more of your work. Thanks. Great, thank you. Great stuff. Thanks Daniel for the great questions. It's a pleasure. Great work. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.